We live in a modern, hyper-connected world where everything is becoming smart and connected. Curious about what lies ahead and how this will impact your daily life? I'm Brett Jordan, and this is Smarter Everything, a podcast on the future of connectivity, powered by Afero. Back in 1999, Kevin Ashton, while working at Procter & Gamble, proposed putting radio frequency identifier chips, or what we now call RFID chips, on products so they could be easily tracked while moving through the supply chain. Since then, the idea, the hype, and the promises of smart and connected devices has grown and evolved dramatically. While the first smart devices were computers, and then phones, and then tablets, today a smart device can be just about anything, so long as it can be connected to use the internet in some way. It is important to note that smart devices, they're not limited to just the consumer space, but can be found in various industry sectors and verticals, such as the medical world, supply chain, industrial applications, grid systems, critical infrastructure, and even smart cities. Over the past few decades, there's been a lot of hype about what smart devices will be able to do for society. Unfortunately, though, the reality has not lived up to the hype, despite a lot of work that has been done by hobbyists, technologists, and early adopters. In part one of this first episode, we will explore where we are in the evolution of smart things and where we expect to be in the near future. We will uncover and talk about the benefits and the exciting things that can come about when you're using smart and connected devices. Today, my guests are Joe Britt, founder and CEO of Afero, and Dr. Hugh Thompson, a leader in cybersecurity globally. I am Hugh Thompson, Managing Partner at Crosspoint Capital. I'm Joe Britt, one of the co-founders and the CEO of Afero. Thank you both for joining today. This is going to be a wonderful discussion. But I'd like to start with you know, a question to both of you on what is the most exciting and, you know, and intelligent, like interactive, like what is the thing that you've seen recently in the smart and connected world that you've just really been intrigued by? Jeez, I know, it's hard to pick. So it's uh, it's a holiday season, and uh, I've got five uh, young kids, and so just the toys that you never imagined would be connected are connected. I'll give you an example. My son is very excited about something that's the equivalent of a Rubik's cube mm. that is using magnetism to get rid of the friction. So you can very quickly, you know, move these cubes around and solve them, but it's completely connected. It's tied in to an iPhone app. And in fact, there is this tiny robot that hooks into all four sides of it and can solve it for you right away, right? And and what's sort of an interesting implication of this is that cube, even when you're outside of using it with the app that knows exactly where each square is and you know, what's the optimized way to get it back, that will be connected. And, you know, it's it's Bluetooth as, as far as I can tell. I mean, we haven't actually opened it yet. But we've got so many things around us that are yearning to be further connected. The beaconing on Bluetooth just being, you know, it's kind of one tiny example. But I think that I think the thing that surprised me is how many devices that have some kinetic component to them are being connected so quickly, whether it's a heating element or moving. And I'm not talking about giant industrial control systems. I'm just talking about normal household items. And you think about that, and there are some profound security implications, some profound risk implications, some of profound, maybe even nation state attack implications to going after a bunch of kinetic devices at once and just causing chaos. So I think it continues to, I don't know, it continues to surprise me how connected we are becoming 
And it's not one thing, it's everything. It's getting to the point where you're surprised that you buy something and it's not connected. Mm -hmm. You know, someday I'm going to get a pencil and pick it up and I'm like, why isn't this thing connected? What's wrong with this? <laughs> so we're close to a tipping point. I, I agree. And that is an incredibly cool use case about the, the Rubik's Cube with the magnetic bearings uh, and the robot that can help solve it. I mean, what a time to be alive, right? But, um, <laughs> you know, when I think about this, I, I, the question of like, what's the, the coolest connected thing that I've seen? I, I, I'm, I'm of two minds, really. There's, there's, there's cool devices like the one that, that Hugh mentioned. Um, I, uh, I recently got a dog and there's a, there's a pet feeder that, um, one of the, it's got a camera and one of the features is that you, know, you can watch your pet on your phone and then remotely you can push a button and it'll actually push a, a treat out, throw a treat out for the, for the dog, right? Seems like a really cool idea. Um, it's a really cool idea, I think for humans. Um, again, there's a kinetic component like, like Hugh was talking about. It's a little terrifying for dogs. Uh, because they're they're not really accustomed to inanimate objects like just throwing treats. I mean, it's it's no problem. Like the dog is totally happy to accept the treat. But um, but I think you know there's there's this interesting sort of tension between like things that are techy cool for people, and then things that are cool in kind of a, a meaningful way to humanity. And I think that's getting back to the point that that you was talking about about everything being connected. Um, you know, before this before this show, I was I was trying to think of, of analogies for um, for things that were techy and cool and advanced um, when they first came out, and now they're just table stakes. We take them for granted. And uh, and the first one I thought of was um, was just running water. You know, you would think it would be really strange if you went to your friend's house and they didn't have an indoor bathroom or they didn't have sinks with running water, but um, that did not become commonplace in the United States until the 1930s. So we've lived with that for a very, very long time. Um, and so I think this is, there, there's two pieces that come away from this. One, um, things that we consider to be common today used to be really tacky and advanced. And that's where we're going with connected devices. To Hugh's point, more and more and more things that, that you go and buy at the store, um, you're surprised if there's not a connected version. That's a great signal that we are approaching that period where um, connected devices become like running water. You know, it's just an expectation. You go to somebody's house, you will at some point just expect to be able to talk to the house and have it respond to you. And I think we're we're kind of at the you know the knee of this really powerful curve now where. Um, uh, certainly techie people have, have gotten a taste of that for a few years, but now with the, the emergence and commonplace nature of smartphones, smart speakers, and every device that you buy, um, having the opportunity to get a connected version um, is, is a sign that we are very rapidly progressing into that future where connected stuff is not special, it's just expected. Right. But I mean, and, and, but I think there's other parallels as well. You know, when you when you talk about the distribution of water, um, that's obviously a health issue as well. Like, how do you make sure it's pure? How do you make sure it's clean? Like, what do you how do you process the water? How do you know that that is safe? And these were really hard problems that, that had to be solved. And they're analogous to a lot of the hard problems that we're facing today uh, around security for these connected devices. How do we make it so that not only can I um, enjoy the convenience of something that's connected, but trust it and know that it's not going to hurt me or my family. Right. And I think that's really at the core of, um, um, of what's most exciting back to your question, you know, Brett, about what's mo what's the most exciting thing I've seen. Well, the most exciting thing I've seen is the, the emergence of a recognition that taking the security of these connected products seriously, uh, is incredibly important. Uh, and something that has to be paid attention to. Yeah, I would agree. You know, I mean, you know, I've been 
bang, you know, banging on this drum for a long time that this is a risk. And clearly, you know, as you mentioned, the technologists and the hobbyists have been exposed to this, you know, IoT, you know, environment for quite some time. But it's just recently over maybe the past year, year and a half, two years that it's really starting to gain traction in, in the mass market. And so there's a part I want to come back to and there's a thread there that I want to pull on. But I just wanted to tell you, you know, my the thing that I think is the most exciting and it's kind of really simple and it's the smart plug. Um, I've been going around and buying these for my neighbors. I've been, you know, buying these hub space, smart plugs, you know, you get them at home Depot, whatever. And, but my wife loves them. And now it's like, whenever we go, we have to fill the shopping cart up because she's like, I want to plug here and I want to plug there. And she wants to pull up her phone and be able to just say, turn on Christmas. And it just turns on Christmas everywhere in the house. And she doesn't have to think about it. She doesn't have to go crawl around on the floor and plug stuff in or, or, you know, worry about, well, I turned on the Christmas tree upstairs, but I forgot the one downstairs. Like, and she is just hooked on, on the simplicity and the ease of this. And I think that is what makes me so excited is we've gone from a world where it was just hobbyists and technologists that were doing all of this, you know, coding and all this, you know, really weird, you know, if then statement things to make everything work and they're building custom apps. And now the average person can just go buy, like, like I said, like these hub space, like light bulbs and like smart plugs, plug them in, use your phone and just, it just works. And my wife and all my neighbors, like I, I started going around and, and like passing these out to my neighbors and everyone's Christmas tree is now has these little plugs. And, and, but I think that for me has been the, one of the coolest things, you know, that I've seen is just how easy and secure it is becoming. So Joe, you, you talk. Oh, gotcha. Brett, you're like the Johnny Appleseed of, uh, of smart home. You know, you're just traveling everywhere and like throwing <laughs> these smart plugs out, you know, and all the apple trees are growing. All the people are yeah. learning about, about this stuff. It's cool. Well, that and, and they, it's easy. Like I don't get questions and people coming back and saying, well, how does it work? Or I'm having issues. And I think that is the testament that we've matured, you know, from this technology space where you have to fiddle and tinker and do all these weird things to something that's just usable. So you were, you were pulling on a, or you were uh, talking about a little bit of a thread I'd like to pull on Joe. And that is about this evenly distributed technology. Um, and maybe you could maybe talk a little bit about that. Maybe Hugh, you could comment from what you've seen. I, I know you run RSA conference. You're part of all of these, you know, national security things and kind of like, you know, what is that evenly distribution of technology? Maybe what are, why has it been a little slow to come to market? The blockers, you know, the challenges. So, yeah, I, uh, I think you're referring to a, a William Gibson quote. And he said that um, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Right. And I think um, it is. It's a great quote. It's a, it's a great idea. And I think if you look at history, um, you see that play out over and over again. You know, I was talking about the water analogy earlier, 1930s in the U.S. The first place that got water was a hotel in the 1830s, right? So it was possible 100 years before everybody had it. And there were similar things with electricity. You were talking about the Christmas tree lights, right? I remember, you know, reading that when uh, home electrification first came along, people were really concerned. They're like, this could burn my house down. I don't, I don't understand how it works. Um, and so there's, these, there's this latency from, like, technology being available to technology really being commonplace. And if you look at if you look at every kind of major consumer technology, whether it's radio or television or the telephone or the internet, right? There's these long lags and then there's this crazy exponential growth. And while people have been talking about um, smart home for a long time, uh, there's, there's a number of components that have to come together to create the perfect storm to allow that exponential curve to take off, right? And, and the really exciting thing um, is that it feels like, based on experiences like you're having in handing out smart plugs, because you, uh, as an experienced security researcher, can feel confident in what you're giving to your friends and family to put in their homes, because you understand how the technology works. Uh, and the proliferation of, uh, of Wi-Fi and high-speed internet in the home and of smartphones, all the pieces are there. Right. All we need now is the spark that's going to actually catalyze right the reaction and make everything take off. So it's an incredibly, incredibly exciting time um, to be in this space and working on this stuff. And, 
and Joe, just to, to add to what you were saying, you know, and, and just think about the smartphone market as an example. There were some very interesting and innovative smartphones, say from Nokia, years mm -hmm. and years ago. Foldable phones, not in the same way that the screen folds on the on the Samsung Galaxy Fold, for example, right. but but very innovative, very interesting, and and super high utility. But it took a learning curve. Like you would not enter using that phone lightly. You would, you would, it, the target market was somebody that was technically proficient. You know, they felt very comfortable with it. They could do troubleshooting on their own. But when the iPhone came along, it was amazing how quickly the accessibility of this kind of technology became. My parents, who I thought would never use a smartphone at that time, they picked it up. It was so intuitive to them. And I remember my mom getting frustrated with something. And so just as a natural instinct, she shook the phone. <laughs> and it so happens that that's the undo command on the phone, right? For what you did. But, but think about the, the thought, the design, the elegance that had gone into it that made it so you actually don't have to think about the technology, the troubleshooting, the how do I get these three different tech ecosystems to work together and maybe it'll be my project for the week I have off type <laughs> of thing. I just plug it in, it works. There's a unified way to communicate. And we're getting we're getting very, very close to that now with the smart home. And that's that's incredibly exciting. There's gonna be a lot of people that would have never imagined themselves being able to embrace this that can embrace it. And I I, I can't help Brett, but I'll also mention, you know, another uh, piece to this which is maybe the darker side of it, when things start to get easy, people always maximize for utility. It's whatever's the fastest path, whatever's the easiest way for me to get it to work, I'll do it. And that's, that's, that's true. That's uh, you know, not, not a bug, but a feature of the human condition, right? That's just, that's just how it works. It turns out though, so often with technology, it's easy to understand the utility when things are done well and it's highly usable, but it's so difficult to assess the risk. Like if I bring some new device into my home and it's got the capability to record audio or to record video or you know, sensory things. Again, maybe there's you know some high utility to it, but I never think of the downside of, well, actually, who can listen to this audio and where is that audio stored and how does it get there? And does it get, to use Joe's water analogy, right? Does it flow from good pipes? Mm -hmm. And, you know, can somebody like just tap into one of those pipes and uh, take a drink of it uh, on its way out? These are the kinds of things that I think are going to come more and more center stage in connected home, connected devices. It's not just what's the utility? Am I adopting it? Can I say make Christmas happen? And, you know, all the things turn on in the house. I think serious questions will come up. And it may not be from individuals, it may be from government agencies or Federal Trade Commission or, you know, just watchdogs on behalf of consumers and say, is this safe? It may be fun, but is it safe? And so we're, we're, I think we're going to hit an epoch in the connected device for the average person where the security, the, the provenance, the, the, you know, what care is being taken after after my data and and this device on the back end is going to come into full focus which i that, i think is fascinating yeah I, I think you both bring up some really interesting points you know obviously on the security side and and what do consumers need to understand and how is that going to you know uh, impact them especially as the proliferation of devices grows exponentially 
Um, you know, how does the consumer know? You know, is the IoT labeling mechanism a, a good option there? What happens with you know, uh, you know, policy and regulation? What about the EU Cyber Resiliency Act? What about the stuff coming out of the UK from DCMS and Ofcom or the stuff out of the White House? What about the Singapore policies? So there's a lot, I think, that we can unravel there. But I was thinking as as you were talking, Joe, you know, about a couple examples of this transformative nature. And, and the two that I came up with was this transition from token ring to Ethernet. And with the, the release of the 3Com, uh, what was it, a 3C905 uh, network card, they just kind of revolutionized. And you went from, you know, ATM and, you know, token ring. And almost overnight, we transitioned to, you know, Ethernet. And, you know, is Ethernet a really great protocol? Actually, it's quite terrible. But it would became so prolific. And I see this happening with IoT devices. We've gone from this really technical, really kind of complicated solution to something that is pretty much turnkey. And the other analogy, which fits in here too, is this transition when Apple released the iPod. And we went from MP3 players and all these different codecs and all these different things. And you had to really tinker and play around and recompile stuff in order to get your favorite codec to work. Apple comes along and says, yeah, let's just make it super easy. Here's an iPod. You put a bunch of music on. Everything just happens and works. And now that's the experience that I see is this distribution of technology back to that original question, you know, how technology is being uh, distributed. Everybody can use this now. And so you can get to that point where you just walk into a home and people say, oh, you know, turn on the lights and you can just be, you know, turn on the lights, you know, or I'm in the kitchen, you know, turn on the lights in the kitchen, you know, <laughs> and like, it should just be that simple. And I think we're right at that, that cutting edge there when that's possible. If I could add a couple of things, I mean, this is, this is super fascinating. Um, you know, as I was listening to Hugh talk about um, the iPhone and, um, and making things simpler, like, yes, that is that is what has to happen for technologies to be adopted on mass, right? So that everybody can use it. Um, Brad, I mean, you were, you were talking about networking uh, and people who like to tinker with stuff. Um, I mean, we remember, um, you know, what it was like when you still had to like configure PPP or if you had a network in your house, nothing auto configured and you had to map out what the network was going to be um, and configure everything manually. And if you got one thing wrong, it just didn't work. Like this is not a consumer friendly uh, experience. It is, it's an experience for, um, for a skilled tradesman, really, right? Somebody who understands that technology deeply. And when things go wrong, can figure out what went wrong. Um, but we have, we have examples of this through history as well. I mean, you were talking about coming in the house and saying, okay, turn on the lights and the lights come on. Yes, that is actually an echo of another technology. So um, getting to the point where you could turn the lights on in your house, even manually with a switch, and have it be safe, like that took a while to figure out. And it definitely required things like standards bodies and government regulation to actually make happen. I mean, we have things like Underwriters Laboratory um, that gives consumers confidence that the heater that they're about to plug in in their house is not going to burn the place down. Um, and so I think, you know, anytime you've got a revolutionary technology, it's like the saying, right? With great power comes great responsibility. And, and that, who does that responsibility fall upon? Um, I think it's unreasonable to expect the consumer who is adopting this stuff just because it was made simple to have a deep, deep understanding of how it works. They shouldn't need to. The same way that they don't need to understand how the electricity uh, that powers their house is generated or how the heater that makes their room warm works. Um, that's, that's the responsibility of, um, of ultimately governments and the companies that build those products. And the companies that build those products benefit from governmental guidance that can come in the form of carrots or sticks um, to, to, to help make sure that they are aligned with um, the best interests of, of the population at large, the ordinary people that are actually using the products. Yeah, Joe, I, I, you know, I, I think you make, make such a great point. And so, some of it, I think, certainly will come down to, to regulation so that there is at least a minimum bar of yeah. safety when something is you know, inside your home, when something's impacting maybe your body, right? And it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's an insulin pump that's hooked right. up to you. I, 
geez, I, I would really love it if some you know third party was was yeah. looking at and regulating those kinds of pieces of technology. And then you have things where maybe the product isn't regulated, but you want to put as much power in the consumer's hands as possible to make an informed choice. And that's that's where I think things get really interesting. You know, and Brett alluded to it earlier, the IoT labeling discussions that are going around both in the US and Europe and in other places, a lot of the discussion is coming down to design of the labels. So what does it look like to a consumer that's about to pick up, you know, a connected dinosaur toy, right? And I say this as someone who just recently purchased uh, such an <laughs> item. All right, 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 right now, like I'm maximizing for utility. Like, wow, I press a button, the roar sounds really good. Like, I can kind of move it around the house. It can track it. That's great. But what I don't have any sense of is, you know, the sensory capabilities it has. I don't even know. Does it have an, a microphone built into it? Not sure. Mm -hmm. Is there a way that you could present this to the user? where at least they would consider it. And, and, and there, might be, there might be some degree of hope in the sense that we have other areas where people are making similar kinds of choices. Like I truly enjoy a very good fried chicken. But when I go into a food store, I can look at the nutrition label and see that, wow, you know, one of my favorite frozen microwavable, you know, fried chicken delights has a saturated fat content um, <laughs> that's 300% of the recommended daily value. Now, I may have on occasion continued to purchase said chicken, but at least I understand <laughs> that, you know, maybe I shouldn't do that very often or, you know, it ha it's having some negative impact on me. I think today there there is no concept of that. It's it's a pure utilitarian. If I, am I going to get the connected one or the not connected one? Even if I don't know if I'll ever connect it, of course I should get the connected one if they're the same price, right? right? That's that that that's the thinking. Hopefully we can at least innovate in the design of the way that we can communicate to a consumer so that they can understand that. That utility may come at a cost of risk and let us help you understand, you know, what that risk may look like. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the big challenge is how to distill a complex risk down into a form that an average consumer can consume and understand. Um, we project that there. Yeah. And it's, it's a really, it's a hard thing to do. Well, and I think it's hard to not make it so overly complicated. You know, I th we've seen this with various other government regulations. You know, we see it on the cyber warfare, cybersecurity side, even with the release of the CMMC version one, like it was really complicated or, you know, common criteria, it was really complicated. And now they're learning, well, actually, what we need to do is just make it really simple. Um, <laughs> and so you need to have a base level of security. And I think that's where people have gotten hung up is trying to tell, you know, manufacturers that there's a certain level of security that you have to have. And it's just table stakes. And if you can't do it, then you can't sell product. And to your point, Joe, about like electricity, like the underwriters laboratory, like you couldn't sell outlets and switches for, you know, electrical current or breakers that don't meet that requirement because it'll cause people's houses to burn down. And I think we need to kind of get to that point, um, whether it's based on like the EN 303-645 specification out of Etsy, or if it's based on something out of ISO, like 27,400 series, um, or anything along those lines. I, but I think we really do need some base table stakes where everything is end-to-end -end encrypted. And there's all devices can be OTA updated and that they are supported for a minimum of three years or five years. Um, you know, and you have vulnerability disclosure policies. And, and I think there's some basic things that every product needs to. Otherwise, the consumer is just not going to know what to do. So shifting gears a little bit. Um, 
let's talk a little bit about the usability and the concerns around usability of some of these smart and connected things. Um, you know, we've hinted around a couple of these. Hugh, you've talked a little bit about it. Joe, you've talked a little bit about it. You know, but like what can users do today versus what do they really want to be able to do? You've prob- everybody probably has a story of a friend or relative who had trouble pairing a Bluetooth device with their phone or with their headset. Um, it's a very kind of techie process, right? At an engineering level, it makes sense what's going on. But um, back to your point about usability, for the case of uh, Bluetooth hands-free in the car, the person just wants to safely talk on their phone while they're driving. That's what they want to do. They don't want to understand how Bluetooth works. Um, and so the challenge for um, engineers and developers uh, is to think about how non-engineers and non-developers use this stuff. And I, I go back to the example Hugh gave before about the iPhone. I mean, that was a, obviously a masterclass in um, figuring out what to not include in the product. And I think that's a really hard um, discipline for many uh, it, because the temptation is there. It's so easy to just add this feature or that feature. But, um, but, but ultimately, it has to come down to what is the use case for thing, this thing? What is somebody actually going to want to do with it, the person who's paying for it? Um, and when we think about smart home, we think about lights and switches and thermostats. These are all very pedestrian products. I want my room to have light. I want to be able to change the color when I have a party here. I want to, I want to be able to have the temperature in the house be comfortable. Um, and so the challenge for any smart home product maker or developer um, is to strip away all of the technology, make it go away, and always just stay laser focused on what that use case is. And then do the hard work of making the connectivity tr- so trivial that it fades into the background and the user doesn't even think about it which is not the case with Bluetooth pairing, like we were talking about a second ago, uh, and also provide credible, uh, a credible approach to securing the connectivity um, for those devices. What would be the one thing you would like people to take away from our discussion today? And I, I can start, and I'll give Joe the, the clo- closing no. words. But I, uh, you, you know, I, I would say that this is an incredible time just to be alive, right? You know, you look at what is happening and how more interconnected we are. First of all, with each other, it, it, it's incredible, and the fact to make that you can make those relationships even with each other more intimate by having these connected devices that maybe they give you peace of mind. Maybe they help you share experiences. Amazing. Amazing. And this is something that can provide incredible utility. It can open new doorways and pathways to people that, you know, have limited abilities or, you know, folks that, maybe otherwise wouldn't be able to stay in their home because they didn't have somebody else like a, a loving relative or child to help watch after them. That that's amazing. I mean, it's just, it's just so heartwarming to see and we were only scratching the surface. So it's a very exciting time to track this space. It's very exciting time to learn and, you know, jump jump into it and, you know, experience the utility of it. But it's also important on the other side to think about as you're gaining that utility, as you're bringing and welcoming these devices you know, into your home, into your lives, that there are risks associated with it. And at the end of the day, I do think it's going to fall heavily upon regulators and you know, testing authorities, standards to come in so that we don't have to think about those risks, but we're still early in the space. So it is something that you know, the average person needs to have at least some awareness of uh, in, the, in the back of their mind. But exciting time, super exciting. Super well put, Hugh. I mean, I, I'm, I'm struck by how I think this conversation is, is tying back very neatly with um, 
with the quote that Brett brought up at the beginning about how the future is already here, just not evenly distributed. And the challenge on technologists, product developers, retailers, governments, regulators, everyone, uh, is to ensure that this very powerful technology is is packaged and distributed in the appropriate forms. And, and those are forms that are, above all else, safe and trustworthy, um, and then useful and practical, and, and always keeping in mind what it is that, um, that the user really cares about, and not getting too infatuated with the technology, and always thinking about what the, you know, the real world use case is. But, um, but as we've discussed, there are uh, so many ways that, that this stuff can be used for good um, and for bad. And so it's, you know, the onus is really on us as creators and technologists um, to make sure that we're always thinking about it um, with the benefits of the user in mind. Um, and and that, uh, that is a really powerful uh, responsibility, a really important responsibility. Um, and so I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to have this conversation today. Uh, because I think it's just sort of underscored a number of things that, that we've all been thinking about for a while. Uh, and it's, it's really great to be able to put them out there and sort of see them in, in this new context, you know, as we, as we kind of share our thoughts on it together. Thank you so much for joining us today for this episode of Smarter Everything. We really love feedback. So please consider taking a moment to send us a comment or a rating on Apple Podcasts. And if you have time and you like this episode, please consider subscribing. We'll see you next time for Smarter Everything.